All right, it's time to uh, get started. And we're going to be digging into the Song of Solomon. And so I hope you have your Bibles and open up to it. Uh, we'll spend a lot of time in the actual text in the next several weeks, um, probably the next four or five weeks, we'll actually be digging through the, the different passages. But tonight, we're going to talk more about how it is organized and what we know about the actual story of Song of Solomon, at least underneath the two-person love story drama version of it in which I will be teaching this class because that's the, the interpretation I take and honestly the interpretation I think everyone should take even though they don't but we'll uh, we'll go we'll, we'll excuse them I guess so uh, no it's a it's a great story it's a it's a beautiful story it is you know again because it is it, it's like a play, like if any of you have ever read Shakespeare, uh, you know, you've got the name of the person and then following it is all the things that they said. And then the name of the next person following it is everything they said. But pretty much the play is just the conversation or the discussion with very little description. You have to put together the scenery and put together the events through what they say, uh, not through any sort of explanation of those things. Uh, one of the uh, difficult things with Song of Solomon is that they, it doesn't have the names in front of who says what. So you kind of have to figure that out by context. And that is part of what creates some of the disagreements and the interpretations and such uh, that you have in the text. Larry, did you have a question? Is that why I saw your hand up? All right, let me unmute you here. It's asking you to unmute. There yeah, it was it was along those same lines. Uh, first time I read this years ago, it, it was just it was kind of confusion who was talking, you know. Yeah. Now my new version has has the word the names in front of it, but okay, I didn't know it. I'm pretty sure those are not original. They are not. And they don't always seem to fit very well. <laughs> they do not. Okay. And I, and I would encourage you to. Um, do your best to ignore them because they will identify depending on whatever interpretation your translation is is showing and so your translation might show the the three character drama where you've got you know the the man the woman and the third you know the second man and they got that whole love triangle uh, depending on whichever interpretation your version takes uh, you'll get different identifiers there on who said what. Uh, those are not original to the text, and so you do your best to ignore those and just read the text. Uh, and, and again, that is part of what makes the Song of Solomon so difficult, is that it does switch back and forth between who's speaking, and you really have to pay attention to the pronouns uh, and those sorts of things. Now, next week, I will actually... Uh, try to type up and send to you before class by email and put it in our Facebook page, the actual listing of who says what and what verses and that sort of thing. Uh, this week, we're not going to dig into that degree of detail just yet. Uh, and so I'm trying to introduce things to you uh, piece by piece here. So let me go ahead and jump in and show you the way I have the story organized that we have in the book of Song of Solomon. And again, remember, there is a lot of interpretation with this. So you have to be cautious here of, of, of what is, you know, um, some of this is going to be my interpretation of it. Just look at it, realize that, and, uh, and we go from there. Everybody see my screen? All right. So. The way I have this story organized is this, and this is the framework that we're going to work off of in this class, uh, that you have the courtship, which is a sort, you know, they, they know each other from the very beginning of the story, uh, but you've got that kind of infatuation period where they're just talking about how lovely the other one is, and there's a very, uh, you know, very beautiful descriptions here all the way from the beginning of chapter one down through about the middle of chapter two, almost the end of chapter two. Uh, and then I believe at verse 16 
of chapter two, we have switched from it just being uh, infatuation and a, and a love connection between a man and a woman to being an actual committed relationship where they are engaged. You kind of have some bolder language there for this short section uh, where they are, they seem to have taken a, the next step in their particular relationship. Uh, from chapter three, verse six, you've down through the end of chapter three, we've got the actual wedding described. And so you've got the, you know, the, the whole idea of those ancient weddings where the groom would travel from his town or across the city if they lived in the same town. And there would be this whole caravan and it would be this great display of honor and, and support where a lot of his friends and family would be walking with him. And so you've got this whole procession that leads to wherever the ceremony was gonna take place, which was often in the home of, of the bride or in the, you know, the, or maybe in a neutral location. And then they get married there by the end of chapter 11. Chapter four, down through the first verse of chapter one, you've got the actual consummation. So you've got the, uh, the story of her observing him and him observing her. And the language there gets a bit spicy, uh, which we'll talk about some when we get to that section. Uh, but you've got this uh, very uh, descriptive and somewhat sexual uh, descriptions of one another. And then you've got there the chapter five, verse one, what I believe to be the climax of the story, which is God speaking. And, and we'll come to that when we get to that lesson. Chapter five, verse two is the story of the honeymoon, which is uh, not necessarily just the, the consummation, but it's kind of the, the beginnings of their marriage. You've got this this, uh, you know, and I call it the honeymoon, not because it's literally the honeymoon like we think of today where you go on a little trip together or a vacation together, but it's that beginning portion of their marriage where everything is just perfect and they're living on love. But when you get to chapter seven, they're no longer living on love. So there's a maturing of the marriage. You've got uh, some, again, their re-expressions of their support and love for each other. Uh, but there are some, uh, some kind of, you know, it, it giving those reassurances because of what happens at the end of chapter six. And then in chapter eight, what you have are flashbacks, uh, flashbacks of who she was as a young lady uh, and the fact of uh, what brought her to this marriage relationship as a pure woman. And, uh, and so you've got some, some kind of glimpses of uh, what it takes to prepare for this kind of good marriage. Uh, so there, again, it, it's a beautiful story here. Uh, and I think it is a, a somewhat idealistic story. Uh, the idealistic story is trying to help us to see uh, the way marriage is supposed to work and see the way marriage is, is uh, you know, how we prepare for marriage, how we come to a marriage that God honors, and then how we continue to build that marriage. Uh, so it's a good study for us today. Uh, now, obviously, there's a lot of differences between then and now. We don't have processionals that lead to weddings. We don't have a week-long feast. We don't have, uh, you know, the, the agricultural society that is mentioned in this book. We wouldn't describe women the way the woman is described in this book. At least I wouldn't advise it because it doesn't seem to go over well. Uh, you know, we, we tend to very much um, think and act and talk differently, uh, but that doesn't mean that there aren't principles and lessons that are in this book that are good for us to learn. So that's why I want to spend some time tonight talking more about the lessons and the principles that we find in the book, uh, so that you can be thinking about some of those as we move forward in the text and talking about the specifics of each, uh, each different section. Any questions on any of that? Not a single one, all right. So then we go back to the slides then. Um, here we go. All right, so there are some parallels. Again, it's easy to, easy to see the modern parallels between the song 
and today's need for innocence and true love. You know, we have a culture that is obsessed with the, uh, honestly, with, with a redefining of love. Uh, we have redefined love as lust more than anything else, which uh, has, I think, in a lot of ways, badly influenced people's interpretations of this book, because this book does talk about the beauty of the human body, and it mentions breast, and it mentions very euphemistically uh, sexual ideas. And so people have taken that and tried to, you know, re talk about it in today's terms, the way we understand uh, the intimate relationship today. Uh, and, and that's really not the way the Book of Song of Solomon talks about it. The Book of Song of Solomon talks about that intimate relationship in a very God-honoring way. And so we need to make sure we recognize that. Uh, but there, I mean, again, our culture is not a culture of innocence. Uh, it is a culture of shamelessness. Uh, I remember very much, uh, e even in my high school career, which was 25 years ago or so, uh, just how free people were in talking about these things. And uh, it was interesting. So a couple of years ago at camp, we did an 80s rock concert. And one of the things we had to do as we were doing that was we had to look through the lyrics of songs from the 1980s and decide whether those songs were appropriate to sing at a camp full, you know, that was designed to bring about godly ideas. It is amazing how many of those songs say things that are very inappropriate. But what's interesting about it is this, singing some of those, or, or so we, we would have kids that would come up to us during that week and say, hey, why don't you do this song? And they would be really excited about it. And we'd be like, well, we can't. Well, why can't you do that song? And we would say, well, it has this lyric in it. And we would give this lyric. And they would go, what? What's that mean? I don't have a clue. And so then we would describe what the lyric meant. And then they would say, oh, well, we would just say it this way. And they just flat out say it. It's interesting how things change <laughs> over time. We used to say things a little more, uh, you know, we were, we, we took, uh, you know, musicians and bands talk just as dirty in the old days as they do today. They were just a little more uh, colorful with it and, and guarded with it. And, uh, and see, these days they just come right out and say it because we, we've started to live in a culture of shamelessness and we just flat out say things. Uh, it's been interesting to me. I, I'm trying to be very guarded with the way I teach this class uh, and be very uh, careful about not being too brash or too crash, uh, crass with the way I, I speak of things. Uh, but it is interesting to me to hear younger preachers who will just come right out and say things uh, with no regard to uh, appropriateness or, or those types of things. And I just the other day, I, I was uh, friends of ours from a different congregation were saying, they, if their preacher says the word sex one more time in a sermon, they are going to stand up and walk out because he says it every single sermon. And I'm like, well, that's kind of how younger preachers are now. They, they don't use euphemistic words. They don't find guarded ways to say things. Song of Solomon is in scripture probably the most unguarded passage of scripture you have. And I think that's one reason we don't study it a lot. But it is still extremely guarded in the way it talks about it. It's very, uh, it uses a lot of illustrations to bring ideas to your mind that you know aren't about a garden, they're about something else. Uh, and so that, that's where um, you still have, even in the conversation here, a lot of innocence and a lot of guardedness and appropriateness uh, that's involved in the discussion. Um, it's also not surprising considering um, how timeless what God created is, that he describes things like the, the, the desires of the flesh, marriage, uh, the intercourse or the, the, the um, relationship that comes in marriage, uh, those types of things. And, and again, one of the reasons I appreciate Song of Solomon so much is because 
we can go too far the other direction and treat what God created as a good thing as an evil and ugly thing because we're trying to be guarded against sin uh, when the reality is God treats it as if it is a beautiful aspect of marriage. And that's one of the things you'll see in this book is just how guarded they were with their relationship leading to marriage. Uh, and, and once marriage happens, then they are unguarded completely. Uh, and, and that becomes a very important aspect of the book. Uh, the imagery and the comparisons are very different, but the descriptions are still very valid. Uh, and you'll see that as we dig into some of the details. Uh, also, um, one of the themes that you find through the book is the woman is extremely unconfident. She is very un, you know, she, she does not have a lot of confidence in her own beauty. She does not have confidence in her ability to please her husband. Uh, and he spends a lot of time in the book talking to her about how beautiful she is and how lovely and how uh, wonderful she is and, and how, you know, just, just complimenting her over and over and over again. And I think that is still a very valid aspect of marriage today. One of the things I've noticed in marriage counseling is a lot of times one of the difficulties in the physical relationship between a man and a woman is the man's fault for not giving the woman enough attention and love and, and compliments and reassuring and, and telling her that she is beautiful and telling her that she is lovely and that she is pleasing and, and all of those types of things. And so that becomes a big aspect of this too. Uh, that, that's one of the things, again, you'll see uh, in that relationship between man uh, and woman. So ultimately the lesson we learned from the song is that our relationship in marriage should be about love. Uh, and, and I don't mean love in the way the world defines it today, which is lust. And I don't mean love in the way that that songs talk about it where it's just kind of puppy eyed, kind of like the picture you see there on the left. It's just, oh, he sings to me, he's wonderful. Oh, I just love him, you know, that kind of thing. That's not really the kind of love we talk about in scripture. Uh, what we do see in this book is that love is very physical. Uh, we display our love in very physical ways. Sometimes that's just uh, touching with the hug, you know, hugs and kisses all the way to intimacy. Sometimes that's just in the way that we physically treat someone. Uh, you know, it's, it's me putting down what I'm working on to be able to go grab or open a jar from my wife. I don't do that very much anymore. You know, after lugging around five children, her arms are pretty beefy, but you know, it's beefy. I don't mean beefy in a bad way. Anyway, so, um, so she, uh, you yeah, know, that idea of being willing to, to serve the other, you know, sometimes it, it's just in the verbal reassurance thing of the other, which takes me to the next one, which is love is emotional. Uh, you know, love is what we feel for the other person. Uh, I get frustrated sometimes when we as Christians try to uh, delineate between the different Greek words for love. Uh, I'm sure you've all heard that before. Uh, right, the idea of there's four different types of love. There's agape, storge, phileo, and eros, and that the Bible teaches agape, that's the God spiritual love. Their Bible teaches phileo, that's the the, the brotherly love. Uh, but the other two, the Bible doesn't really talk about. Has anybody heard this? Yes, no, uh, some. Uh, I'll be honest, that's not really true. Uh, and, and the reason I say that is uh, the agape word uh, is used to speak of rape at one point in scripture, uh, which does not sound like godly love to me. Uh, it's used in the, in the Septuagint to speak of Judah and Tamar. And so, uh, not Judah and Tamar, uh, the other Tamar. Um, so, I mean, you've got the uh, you know, the agape isn't exclusively used of this spiritual godlike love. Uh, phileo is also mentioned in scripture. We are told in scripture to, uh, not uh, phileo, obviously, storge is also mentioned in scripture. That's supposedly family type love. 
uh, but we are told to phileo storge one another as Christians. So they combine those two words into one uh, in Romans chapter 12. Uh, and so again, those words are in there more than we think they are. And if, uh, eros, which is that kind of uh, erotic or physical type love, clearly is talked about in scripture, even if it's not mentioned in, by that Greek term. Uh, you've got that, that physical feeling mentioned in scripture. So again, it, it's part of what God created. Um, you know, I, I, if I'm going to delineate love, I want to delineate it the way the Bible actually does. And it doesn't necessarily do it with terminology. It does it with context. That sometimes love is physical. Sometimes love is emotional. Uh, and emotional love is a, is a, you know, it's something we should participate in. It's something that we should have for our spouse. Uh, there is mental love, that idea of we decide to love one another. It is a decision that we make. Um, that is uh, something that just is, is a part of, you know, I, I decided back 20 years ago to love Tiffany. And I've stuck by that decision. There are some times when uh, I am not her favorite person in the world, yet she still chooses to love me even when I am not very lovable, right? That happens in marriage. Uh, and so again, there's that commitment side of love. Uh, and then there's also the spiritual side of love. You know, God is love, 1 John 4, 8, uh, but also just the idea of, you know, when Part of our spiritual walk with God is learning to love people the way God loves them. And I, I'm not convinced God always feels hunky-dory towards me, but God has never failed to sacrifice for me. Uh, and that, that's part of the great love of God is that he's willing to treat us in a way uh, that we don't deserve to be treated. Uh, that's what grace is all about. He loves you. Know, uh, I love, you don't have to turn over to it, but uh, one of my favorite passages in the New Testament is Titus chapter 3, which says, but when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us. You know, why did he save us? Because he loves us. Uh, and, and not because he had some sort of emotional connection to me, although I don't think that's uh, a, a wrong concept. Uh, but because it is who he is. He's just a loving being, uh, and therefore, if we are going to be like him, we should also be loving beings. Uh, so again, that, that's an a important part of this uh, discussion. Uh, any questions before I continue moving on? No? All right. Going back to the slide again. Here we go. Um, so for love to be real, it has to have one defining trait. And this is one of the things you're going to see through the Song of Solomon is sacrifice. They are willing to sacrifice for each other. They are willing to sacrifice their families. They're willing to sacrifice their lives previously. They're willing to sacrifice, uh, you know, that it's just part of what they are. Uh, love is a sacrificial thing, always. And whether we're thinking of physical, emotional, mental, or spiritual, we sacrifice a part of ourselves in order to love somebody. Uh, it, it's just one aspect that is a necessary part of saying you love somebody. If I say I love somebody, what I'm saying is I am willing to sacrifice for them. Those two are one in the same concept. If I'm not willing to sacrifice myself for somebody, then I do not love them. I will be bold enough to say it that way. Okay, so sacrifice is, an, is a defining characteristic of love, whether that be my friends. If I say I love my friends, the reason I can say I love them is because I sacrificed my time to be with them. I sacrificed my attention. I might sacrifice my money to buy them gifts. I'm going to sacrifice for them in some way. Uh, my church, same thing. I'm going to sacrifice my time, energy, and money in order to do things for my church. Uh, my family, I sacrifice a lot of time, a lot of money, and a lot of energy for my family, right? And we all do. It, it, it's part of what it means to, to love them. And so that is the, 
the, the defining characteristic of love. God desires that we love one another. And that begins in courting. And I think that's the reason the book of Song of Solomon begins with that courting or dating relationship between this man and this woman. It doesn't begin at their wedding. It doesn't begin at their consummation. It begins when they are growing to love one another. That's when God starts displaying for us what this love should look like. And that's one reason, again, like I said last week, I think we should be studying this book with young people, studying it in our marriages together. Uh, we need to be studying this book because it is, a, it is a description of the way this relationship is supposed to work. Uh, and, and it starts back in courting. Uh, that's one of the things I'm, I'm going to have to be very careful about because that used to drive me nuts when I was told this of, you know, uh, you, one of my kids starts dating one day and he comes home and he goes, dad, I really love her. Nah, you don't, you don't know what love is, son, right? I mean, that could be my response because he doesn't love her the way love really is. But that doesn't mean he doesn't love her. It doesn't mean he's not starting that process. It doesn't mean he's not developing that relationship. And if he is feeling or deciding or, or having the physical uh, uh, connection or whatever it is, whatever is causing him to connect the concept of love with this girl, or when I, you know, my daughters start dating with those boys, then I have to help them through that feeling. I have to help them through that, that scenario. And part of that is here in the Song of Solomon. Um, practically speaking, that, that means we need to be, uh, you know, in, in courting. Uh, you can apply a, a lot of biblical principles like putting the, uh, someone else's interest above your own. Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Right? That begins in courting. It should now, honestly, that begins even before courting because we should be doing that for everybody, right? But that especially should be true when I'm trying to develop a deeper relationship with somebody. I should know that I should be putting their needs before my own. That doesn't end in marriage, although I see some marriages that probably need to do this a little more than they do. That idea of putting the other's needs before your own is something that should be carried through the entire relationship from courting all the way to death. Uh, and so that's an important aspect of this. You know, learning to treat others well, Luke 6, verse 35, doing good to all, uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 15, uh, making sure that we control our physical passions while they should be controlled. First uh, Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 3 through 8 talks about that. And that's a lot of what the beginning of Song of Solomon talks about. Uh, so again, all of that is important. Uh, one other passage that I always, uh, that, that struck me when I was a teenager, uh, especially with the whole courting process, but this is also true even in marriage. First uh, Timothy chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. 1 Timothy 5. I'll turn over there and read it. You don't have to turn to it, uh, but you can write it down if you're taking notes of anything. Uh, don't rebuke an older man, but exhort him as a father, younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, and the younger women as sisters with all purity. That says in every relationship, whether it is courting, whether it is just friendship, whatever it is, I am to treat people like I treat my physical family. So older men should be given the same respect that I give to my own father. And older women should be given the same deference that I give to my own mother. And for me as a teenager, I had to learn and probably did not learn well enough that I should view all of those young ladies around me as I viewed my own sister. 
Uh, and so that becomes a really important aspect of the way we should treat people. Treat them like family, love them like family, and you will not go wrong. If you do not love them that way, you most often will. Uh, and, and so that becomes a, an important aspect of what we're uh, trying to do. Uh, so again, when we love others, we put their needs, not our own lust, first, because we should be responding with purity. I have told many, 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 many young people, if, a, if, a, if another young person treats you and tries to do something with you that is inappropriate, they do not love you because they are not willing to sacrifice their own selves for your needs. That is one of the things we're going to see as we go through the Song of Solomon is just how quickly that is the response that the man has to the woman early on in the book. Uh, and, and, and again, uh, if you look there in Song of Solomon, I'll just kind of give you a little uh, precursor to this. Uh, you're reading through right here at the beginning. You've got the woman talking about kisses and fragrances and then and uh, caresses and uh, all these things that she desires and not necessarily that they are doing but that she is desiring and you've got the man making others you know state short statements about her own beauty uh, about how beautiful he finds her and reassurances to her uh, about about you know the way um, he feels about her and the way she uh, he loves her you look over in places like chapter two, verses seven. Young women of Jerusalem, I charge you by the gazelles and the wild does of the field. Do not stir up or awaken love until the appropriate time. Now that's likely her speaking. Now look with me again over in chapter three, verse five. Young women of Jerusalem, I charge you by the gazelles and the wild does of the field, do not stir up or awaken love until the appropriate time. Um, what we're gonna have as I start to, if I give you the details of who's speaking when, uh, you're gonna have some, some statements made here by both the man and the woman where they are saying, you know what? We find each other intoxicatingly beautiful. We cannot do things that are wrong or inappropriate or before their time. Because if we do those things before their time, it ruins everything. And that's one of the things I, I, I see through this book is that everything is about making sure you do things when they are appropriate. Uh, this is one of my, again, y'all know I love quoting C.S. Lewis, uh, but he says, love is not an affectionate feeling, but a steady wish for the loved person's ultimate good as far as it can be obtained. Isn't that a great quote? It's not an affectionate feeling, it's seeking their good. Uh, and I think that's something we need to recognize as we uh, go through this class, that while it is going to talk about things that we don't normally talk about together, uh, you know, we don't normally sit around and have discussions that involve discussing body parts and things like that, um, but what you find in this book is that there is a, a continual uh, focus on deferring to the other person's needs and deferring to what is appropriate and right, and that becomes a, a, a real uh, theme for the book. Uh, and so I hope that you'll, you'll recognize that as we go through, um, at least in my interpretation of the book, that, that's what we're going to run into. Any questions, thoughts, additions? Yep, go ahead, uh, Larry. Asking you to unmute again. There you go. Okay. Uh, I hate to be the only one talking here, but <laughs> uh, in the in the interpretation of this, how does how does this idea of courtship fit with arranged marriages and stuff? Did, did they have courtships like we think of courtships? Uh, from the historical point of view? 
Um, yes and no. So typically speaking, with an arranged marriage, you still knew the family. Like it would be an arrangement between two families that know each other. And so there would still be the growing up together. There still would have been the, um, and, and again, typically, uh, there still would have been a, a familiarity with one another. And so that to me is one of the reasons I think this book is so appropriate is that even if it is an arranged marriage, which we're not sure, we're not told that in the text, right. even if it is an arranged marriage, you still have the, uh, the affection passing between the two. Uh, so uh, there, there still is that kind of commonality with our, with our current arrangement. A lot of times the arranged marriages were not so much the way we think of it today, where you've got the, um, you know, uh, this young child and this young child that are promised to marry each other 20 years from now. Uh, the way their arranged marriages work typically were, I've got a young maiden in my, you know, a daughter, and here's this established you know, 30, 40 year old man. I'm going to marry my 16 year old daughter to this 35 year old man because he can take care of her and she can take care of him. Um, and, and that's the way their arranged marriages work. Uh, that, you know, that, if that's part of the story that's just unspoken, uh, that would make sense with the story because he has fields he takes care of. He has uh, clearly a, a, a working business of some sort. And she is just, you know, she's called later on in the book, uh, a young lady. Uh, and so you see uh, that being uh, you know, part of this. I'm seeing if she was called that early in the book too, but um, so that, that, you know, uh, I, I, I don't know that those two ideas conflict with each other as much as it, you know, it allows us to see that the affection could still be there even in those odd situations. Okay. Who else? Okay. Anybody else have questions, comments? Everybody wants to get off here early. All right, go ahead, Matt. Okay. Um, how do the other third parties in this add to the theme of love, such as the brothers and the ladies of Israel. How do they fit into this dialogue between these two? Okay. What are, they, what, are they, what are they adding to it? So the young ladies of Jerusalem are kind of like a chorus. If you think of this from a drama perspective, uh, they are. That I don't know that they add as much as there's just a. Uh, you can you can view them kind of like her little gaggle of friends that she gets to talk to through the story, and they get to all giggle and laugh with each other. Uh, that that's kind of the the image that's in my head. Uh, you also have him speak to the young ladies. Uh, the brothers at the end of the book, I, I think, add because they give us kind of a background story of who she is and what they did to protect her and to guard her and to watch over her. Uh, so we'll we'll get to that when we get to the end of the book. But um, the the there's also a narrator in the book on occasion. Um, I, I think, you know, I know chapter five, verse one mentions him, probably your version says narrator there, and I can't remember if there's another spot, maybe not. Um, I think at the end of the book it does. You got another narrator there? Uh, chapter eight, verse 12. Uh, mine doesn't say narrator there. So again, oh. it's one of those, that depends on your translation. Um, so again, it, it's one of those uh, as you go through the story, you know, some of it's very easy to see who's talking. Some of it is not so easy to see who's talking. Uh, but ultimately, uh, the, the young maidens become like the, the friends that get, get to make comments um, that aren't directly between the man and the woman. So uh, there's also a section in the story where the man is gone. Uh, and so a lot of the conversation is between her and her little maidens. Uh, because they were discussing what to do about the fact that the man is gone. And so it, it allows that conversation to happen too. Okay. Who else?
Yep. Go ahead. I, I, it's like an invisible hand there in the Poe family. So, all right, y'all go ahead. Do we have to unmute or do you unmute? No, you're unmuted. Okay. I, I just noticed some things about the book. And, you know, you look back in the Old Testament and love was not talked about. I mean, you look at, you look at husband and wives and you, even if it might have said he loved her, you never really saw anything that pointed this out. You never saw a Romeo and Juliet type, hardly any kind of thing like that. And then here you come to Solomon, Song of Solomon, and he reveals all these things that has just been overlooked or never seen up until this point. Mm -hmm. And um, it's just, it just strikes me as odd to get to this point uh, and, and start talking so much about love. I mean, far beyond what we hear in the, even in the new Testament, as mm -hmm. far as, you know, a personal characteristic. Um, and, and I'm just, bringing out some things that I noticed in the book. And also if it's, you know, if it's Solomon speaking, which I, I know you, you feel like it could be somebody else, I don't know, but you notice that he, Solomon had 300 wives and 700 concubines. Mm -hmm. And surely there were things he would have loved more about one than he loved about the other, but he picks out one. And I think the one is the very important part of this. Uh, it carries over into ideas in the New Testament and Jesus and the church. Uh, in, in the Old Testament, surely there was more than one man that was faithful um, besides Abraham, but he picked Abraham and made a, made a group out of him. They didn't follow him. You know, they didn't follow God. And so he could have picked whoever he wanted um, and, and made a great nation out of them. And that could have, would have been his chosen one. Uh, and so I, I see a, a double meaning in this. Uh, when you look at this and you realize how Christ delights in the church, as far as the husband and the bride, it, it just because, you know, it, there may be more than one meaning to all of this. Um, and, yeah. and you can, and you can take it and if you direct it one way, it's, you know, about Christ in the church, it, it works out really well. And if you, you know, God and the Jews, it works out really well. And I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with what you're saying. I'm just saying that there, there could be two or three fold meanings to this that all match. And especially when it comes to love. Yeah. Well, and I do, I do very much think that there are a lot of lessons in the, in the text that we you know, we won't have time to dig into. Uh, I, I do think it's possible to draw out a lot of parallels between what's here and like Christ and the church and what's here with, you know, the Jews always did that with the story of God and Israel. Uh, you, you have a lot of parallels in ways that people have interpreted the book. Um, it is interesting, you know, the first time that the word love is used in the Bible, does anybody know when that is? Any takers on that? The first time the word love is ever used in the Bible is Abraham loved Isaac. First time ever. Which is interesting to me. Like Keith said, there, there's really not a lot of, you know, statements about husbands loving wives and wives loving husbands. Uh, you, you know, they, they found them attractive. That's mentioned before this point that, that uh, you know, for instance, uh, you know, just how much Jacob, uh, how he felt about uh, uh, Rachel as opposed to Leah. I mean, you've got, uh, and again, oftentimes the explanation there is how beautiful they were. And so you see, uh, we, we think of that as being very shallow, but uh, again, there was something about Rachel that made Jacob work 14 years. And I've seen some beautiful ladies, but I've never seen one worth working for 14 years on a, on a guarantee of a, of a trickster, you know, uh, so, I mean, it, it's one of those, uh, you know, you, you see that and go, there, there's got to be something very deep to that, to the way that they felt about each other and the love they had for each other. Uh, so there, but there's a lot that's unsaid up until you get to this, this book. Uh, and this book seems 
so odd where it is in scripture because it just it, it's unique in the way that it presents things uh, and, and so that's why a lot of people have sought for those those other meanings in the text uh, but Keith is right I mean very well you know uh, whether they were intended to mean those things or not we can't know but if the meanings are there and supported by other scripture then okay uh, you know, clearly Christ loved the church, and you see that sacrificing for the church and those types of things. So those are all very good uh, lessons to take out of this text. Uh, all right, Meredith? To me, the closest you could come to that kind of language would be uh, in Proverbs, the woman of folly, the way that she talks and that whole scenario. Yeah. And it just goes along with the point that you're making about the motives um, of love and how it seeks the person's best interest and in that case it's completely selfish it's you know a similar context or some some imagery but um it's very selfish and destruction is the is the result yeah yeah absolutely any other comments and questions addition I don't see anybody, so then we will just kind of uh, wrap it up there. What I want you to do is uh, for this week, if you'll go back and read chapters one and two, uh, that's where we're going to spend most of our time next Wednesday night, chapters one and two. I would even encourage you, if you get a chance, to listen to chapters one and two. So down, you know, we did that with the book of Revelation uh, back several months ago. You can do it with this book too. Listen to chapters one and two. They're pretty short. You could probably turn it on while you're in the shower and listen to it pretty simply uh, just while you're doing something else. But I think it could be beneficial for just kind of filling your head with the images and with the ideas uh, that are talked about and uh, maybe even try to put into your head exactly you know, what do they look like based on the descriptions that you have there in chapters one and two. Uh, and we'll we'll see, um, kind of dig into some of that a little bit next week. Okay, uh, Sandlin, we are all thrilled to see you up and and sitting up and and looking happy and healthy and things are are looking good. That that that's awesome. Uh, very thankful for that. Uh, so everybody just kind of lost my screen there. All right, everybody. Uh, I'll turn the uh, mics back on. Y'all can talk for a few minutes, and then we'll uh, I'll end the um, I'll end the meeting in just a minute. One at a time. It's annoying. There's a mute all button. But there is no <laughs> unmute all button. That would sure make life easier. Yes, it would. I think it, you can um, let people unmute themselves, though. If you turn that on, you can just be like, all right, everybody, unmute yourself. Yeah, you can. I that think is on. has permission to do that. Mm -hmm. well, I just mean at the end. Like, don't let everybody go unmuting themselves willy-nilly throughout the class. But uh, at good. the end, you can turn that on. Hey, when um, I was listening to this on the way home, I, so that was that was great to just listen to it. Um, but I thought, oh, this this woman in uh, Song of Solomon, we would have an announcement about her because she wore way too much perfume. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, and we'll get into this some in the descriptions, but when you lived in their culture, perfume was a very good thing to cover up yeah. the other smell. It was. <laughs> Riding a camel for a week. <laughs> Man. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't know, help you out a little bit. I know you made the statement that uh, you you never seen a woman that you had worked 14 years for, but you, you meant until you met Tiffany. I know you <laughs> well, still uh, working for her. At this Beefy point, Tiffany. For her for 21, so we're good. I mean, <laughs> uh, hey, y'all. Uh, I just got a message that my daughter and her husband right. headed to the hospital. We'll see what that means. <laughs> well, that's exciting. All right. Is she to her due date yet?
No. Uh, no. It's close though. Oh, okay. This was in a week, so. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> that little guy will be here shortly then. <laughs> I know. What are they? What are they going to call you, Larry? Uh, What's he going to call you? Larry. Maybe they'll call me every now and then. <laughs> What's he going? <laughs> like this is my grandfather, Larry. This is every now and then. I had. I hadn't uh, thought much about that, and I don't know if they have either. So, <laughs> I think that's the first thing Mom thought of as soon as I was like, "We're having a baby." She was like, "All right, I got it." 